Okay, there we have um, a good introduction to water and poverty, the importance of, of, of groundwater as a source of rural water supply, increasingly as a source of, of urban water supply, and the argument that as we face uh, an increasingly variable climate with big uncertainties, the role and importance of groundwater will increase, and not just for domestic supply, but supporting irrigation as well. Which does beg some questions about whether there is enough water to do the things we want to do with it. Um, and although the impacts of climate change on water scarcity have not been studied in much detail, I mean, the IPCC fourth assessment report and the specific technical report on water are largely silent on groundwater, we still can say a few things, and I think Alan summarised them, them well there. But if we're looking for certainty from climate change downscaling, particularly uh, over continental interiors, then I guess we have a long time to wait. But talking about scarcity brings me on to the second speaker, because... Uh, Richard Taylor on my right is going to um, question conventional notions of scarcity and he's going to take up Alan's point, I think, about the importance of storage. Um, so let me just very briefly introduce uh, Richard Taylor. Um, he is a reader in hydrogeology in the Department of Geography, University College London. He also holds a faculty position in the Department of Geology in Makere University. Did I get that roughly right? Roughly. I was, I was practising it beforehand. In Uganda, with research interests in water supply, water resources management, and some of the drivers of change affecting groundwater resources, including but not limited to climate change and climate variability. So, Richard. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, those people standing up, uh, their seats yeah. here, there are no pe uh, I'm, you know, informed of that. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, what I thought I'd try to do in 20 minutes or less is um, follow up Alan's point about how well groundwater is taken into account um, in our discussions about, in discussions about adaptation, not only to, let's say, climate change, but also to uh, other drivers of change, population growth, changes in demand. And um, what I'm going to argue is actually the discourse at the moment about uh, water availability has systematically ignored groundwater or underrepresented groundwater. And really, I would argue that we don't have a very good understanding of water scarcity, particularly in Africa, and yet it may have more global um, uh, implications as well. And in fact, this issue of storage, which we'll come to, is critical. And storage is systematically ignored in any discussion about water scarcity. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and for instance, if we look at uh, headlines about water scarcity, um, uh, bigger threat than the financial crisis, water, another global crisis, um, I, every, obviously, every, I imagine most people in this room are uh, concerned about or working toward or have interest in uh, the notion of uh, the global water crisis. And the first thing to know is our... Hang on a moment, Richard. <laughs> Stay here? <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. No. I'm, uh, as you know, I'm, I work at a university, so I'm used to sort of walking up and down. I don't know how many miles I do walking up and down, but anyway, I'm going to try and confine myself to stand still. All right. Um, the dimensions of the water crisis are defined, okay, by a particular metric. So if you read the second or third sentences of most newspaper articles talking about water scarcity, they will refer to millions of people living under conditions of water stress or water scarcity. I think it's important and informative to figure out what it is they actually mean. So for instance, when we, de when we define water scarcity or water scarce conditions, we're looking at resources per capita of less than 1,000 cubic meters per year. Per, per, well, so per capita being, uh, so less than 1,000 cubic meters per capita per year. There are a number of other markers. Uh, there's one called uh, um, uh, relative water demand, and uh, it's calculated very similarly. 
And I'm going to explain just for a moment how we come up with this number of 1,000 cubic meters per year, because I think it's quite important that we understand what do we mean, again, by water scarcity. So this was actually developed, you know, post-Club of Rome in the 1970s, when people were worried about, do we have enough food on this planet to, uh, uh, um, or were, were, were there many people in an imminent threat of starvation? People are trying to calculate, and there are notions of carrying capacity, which aren't terribly popular at the moment. And people began to come up with metrics or markers. How much water do we have for how many people? Or how much food do we have for how many people? And this came out of work uh, mainly from Malin Falkenmark in, in Sweden. And she was looking at, well, let's look at it. How much water do we have uh, for people? And so she started with some preliminary estimates and was saying, look, um, the average person uses about 100 liters of water per person per day. Or so, whatever, per day. Now, in the UK, you probably all know we all use roughly around 140 uh, liters, and some of you may use a little, little bit less, and some of you may be using more, depending on your power shower or whatever. Um, but a number of about 100 liters per person per day. And um, obviously, there are some people who don't use that, mu that amount, and I come from Canada, and we're pretty uh, wasteful with water. We're probably using around 200, 250. And my, my, uh, my American neighbors to the south, some places are using 300. And actually, if you're in Phoenix, you might be using 600. So it's pretty astounding, the per capita usage. But what they said is, look, you don't only drink water or wash water. Here. You have other needs, food, uh, industrial needs. So they, let's come up with a holistic amount of water that people need per person per year. We'll multiply that 100 liters per person by 20. So that a net annual, sorry, 100 liters per day multiplied by 365 days in a year is 36 and a half cubic meters. Round that to 40. That's 40 cubic meters per person per year. Multiply that by 20 to encompass the food and any other industrial products you use. And you're looking at around 840 cubic meters per person per year. That's basically their demand. And so they said, look, if you have double that amount, if this sounds a bit vague and a bit of arm waving, well, it is. Um, if you have double that amount, they said, you're water sufficient. If you have less than that amount, then you're either water stressed or water scarce. And if you have less than 1,000 cubic meters per year, you are living under water scarce conditions. So that's how demand was estimated. Renewable freshwater resources were determined by river flow. Okay? So you, uh, you then divide your river discharge, so the cubic meters of water available per was defined by river flow. So discharge in cubic meters per year divided by number of people. Okay? And if your number is greater than 1,700 cubic meters per person per year, you're fine, according to this in index. And if it's less than 1,000, well, things aren't so good for you. And so we began to look at projections. Okay? And the plots that you can see here look at in the year 2000, we're looking at around between 1 and 2 billion people on this planet live under conditions of water stress and water scarcity. And depending on which um, emission scenario, which, uh, whether you think we're going to be very polluting in the future, whether you think we're going to survive Copenhagen and come up with a new agreement fairly shortly and be more cooperative, yeah, it depends on which of the IPCC carbon emission scenarios you consider and population scenarios. So for different future projections, and uh, for different definitions of water scarcity. But uh, if we look at the, stay with the one on the left, which is the 1,000 cubic meters per person per year, you're looking at water, a, a, a billion, between one and one and a half billion um, people living under conditions of water scarcity, maybe doubling or tripling um, over the next century. And this is pretty scary stuff, really. And this is where people begin to think about water wars and how we're all going to uh, 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 go to war over water. If we look at the conditions in Africa, for instance, you can see that there are similarly um, uh, slightly pessimistic uh, 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 projections where you see the countries in orange on this attached map are ones that are living under water scarce conditions and the ones that are in that light brown are living under uh, uh, water stress. And if we move between, and if you'll see if you look at the plot on the right, there's quite a few of those countries which are in light blue move to a darker blue and they begin to move under these um, criteria of water stress and water scarcity. So basically you have a situation in Africa where you have uh, an increase, or, you know, fairly dramatic increases in the number of people living under water, uh, living under conditions of water stress and water scarcity. Well, as I'm going to argue over the, hopefully fairly briefly, what I'm going to argue is I don't think that this metric is terribly meaningful, terribly representative, or terribly informative. 
So I'm not denying that there may be a water crisis, or there is actually a water crisis out there. I'm just saying I don't think we have a very good understanding of what it is. And, uh, and um, another question which I'm not going to even try to address here, I think it's best suited for the discussion, but who uses this map? Journalists? DFID? I mean, water managers don't use that map. So what's it all for, and why do we do it? Anyway, I'll move on. Um, first of all, one thing to note is freshwater availability speaks nothing of access to safe water. So for instance, the map on the left, it looks fairly similar to the map you've just seen, indicates areas that are under conditions of water stress and water scarcity. The map on the right is showing you areas where you have access to uh, fresh water. So for instance, Ethiopia in red, uh, the Democratic Republic in green, uh, of Congo in light green, those are conditions where there is very limited access to uh, safe water, meaning that people have uh, a safe water within a convenient or reasonable distance from their dwelling. If you look at Algeria and Egypt and South Africa, areas that are actually under conditions of water uh, uh, scarcity, you can see that they have proportionately very good access to safe water. So there really isn't a relationship between water scarcity, as we currently define it, and access to safe water. That's an important thing just to, if you weren't aware, just to, to, to be aware of. Secondly, um, there's no relationship between water stress, water scarcity, and water quality. We don't actually consider water quality at all when we come up with these numbers. And uh, seeing uh, 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 as many water resources are under increasing threat from contamination from all sorts of human activity, and maybe some natural activities as well, um, n excluding water quality is not uh, is a problem, actually. Um, it's also one of the key issues under the current World Water Day is um, one of the themes this year is the issues around water quality. That's another theme of this year's World Water Day is the issues around uh, environment. And again, water stress index does not consider any water that may be used for the environment or for ecosystems. We, it's a very anthropocentric uh, measure. It's just simply how much water uh, people interest, uh, are, uh, that are of interest to uh, uh, people. Now, getting back to this theme about stores, and I think this is, uh, is this? Yeah, it does work. Great. All right. If you, uh, many of you are probably aware of this, but I just, uh, uh, the, the, uh, if we look at freshwater storage around the planet, the first thing to recognize is most of the water stored on the planet is in ice. Much of that pretty much at the polar ice caps, some of it in alpine glaciers in the Himalayas and the Andes. A large part of the accessible uh, uh, freshwater storage on the planet is in groundwater. And if you can look, there's surface water, which is a hundredth of the amount of groundwater. And that surface water is then broken up into lake water, swamps, and at the top there, river. Now, if you remember, we measure our estimate of freshwater renewable re uh, resources using that thin sliver there. That bit there? plays no role in how we estimate water availability. This bit also is not well taken into account. We just focus on that. Um, now, the other assumption is we use mean annual river runoff. By its very definition, it means there's no changes in storage. It is only focused on the mean annual river discharge. So. It speaks nothing to whether there is substantial groundwater uh, water available or substantial reserv surface reservoirs, whether you receive substantial proportions of your water from meltwater flows. Now, if we begin to think about changing changes happening, if we think of hydrological change associated with climate change, um, it's how valid is this assumption of steady state fluxes? I would question it. An atmosphere can hold more water, rainfalls are going to become more intense. This will in turn affect soil moisture. Soil moisture becomes more var variable under more intensive or more variable rainfall. And in th that in turn affects each of the stores themselves or the stores respond. So this is not a terribly good measure of, ha of estimating what uh, um, uh, water resources are available to you. Another important limitation mean annual river runoff does not disaggregate, does not indicate to you, you have no measure of water that is available ephemerally, very occasionally, and concentrated in a, in a drainage channel against water is, that is much better distributed in time and place, groundwater, 
and uh, that's uh, better distributed throughout a basin as groundwater, groundwater ultimately re uh, resulting in, in base flow discharges. Now, this is a problem, okay? This is a problem I would say that's a global problem, the two, pro the two criticisms I've just ventured to say. I would say it's particularly a problem in Africa, okay? As, in, as uh, Alan indicated to you with the earlier map, there are large areas of Africa where they have very low rainfall during different periods of the uh, uh, months of, of low rainfall. And river discharge in Africa is more variable than anywhere else on the planet. Okay? The only place that's even remarkably close, uh, even measurably close to the variability in river discharge in Africa is Australia, with a very, you, you might say, not well evenly distributed population. Okay? So Africa is where people are living in highly variable hydrological systems and the rest of the planet really doesn't live or experience the same kind of variability in its hydrological conditions. Which brings me to the notion of the importance of stores. We know something, okay, uh, we have some very imprecise statistics at the moment, but let's just look at some of them. Groundwater constitutes 25% of renewable freshwater resources in Asia in Africa, it's been estimated at 51%. So the fact that our measure of water resources doesn't include or doesn't represent that is not terribly helpful. The second point to make is, again, it's suggested that renewable groundwater resources in Africa are um, double that of China and nearly four times that of India. Okay, a little side bit. I don't really necessarily believe these statistics, okay, myself, all right? I think they're pretty crude, and there's going to be tremendous spatial variability in bountiful groundwater versus not very much groundwater. But what I'm trying to point out is there is a highly variable, highly hydrologically, highly variable environment that our people are living on. There is a resource which has potentially got a lot of water in it, and it's systematically excluded from the discussions of water availability. I think these numbers are probably optimistic but we don't really have very much data. And there's a strong need for us to do a lot more research and to work with people who are using that data to better understand it. Now here, this is probably the, the most damning evidence against uh, the use of water scarcity as a metric in Africa here, the, 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 the water stress index. Um, <clears throat> mean annual river runoff does not consider or include soil moisture storage. Yet in Africa, almost all the food produced in Africa is drawn from soil, moisture, from soil moisture. This has a twofold impact. One, you don't, first of all, you're not including soil moisture in your measurement of your available renewable freshwater resources. So that's a bit of a problem. But more importantly, your estimate of water demand, 20 times that 100 liters per day, is based on a fixated notion which largely comes from places like the United States and places like India and China where groundwater fed irrigation or other forms of irrigation are critical to their food production. Food production in Africa does not depend on this irrigated, on, on this, uh, this focus on, uh, on irrigated agriculture. So what you're doing by you applying that metric is dramatically exaggerating the water demand that is there. As an example, the, let me go back for a moment if I can, yeah, okay. You're looking at a photograph from Bushenyi in southwestern Uganda, which exports tea, matoki, uh, and uh, uh, meat, livestock, anyone in the room who knows this area of southwestern Uganda, it's agriculturally very productive. They don't have a problem with access to renewable freshwater resources, though they do have problems with access to safe water. That's largely issues of uh, infrastructure and development, not whether the water is actually available. Yet, projections of water scarcity in this region approach that of Israel. Now, that doesn't look much like Israel to me. Now, I know that's not the best evidence I can give you, okay? But what I'm trying to point out to you is the marker of dividing river discharge by the number of people in an area is not necessarily the best measure. There's tremendously productive water being used not only in the soil, but before a river makes it to a gauging station, many, much of it will be lost through evaporation. Evaporative fluxes are fairly intense in the tropics. So you have an, uh, uh, an, underestimated, an underestimation of the water resources. You have an overestimation of the demand. So we run into problems of particular pessimistic uh, projections of water scarcity. Now, let's now try and look more positively. But again, we run into some of the problems. 
The water stress index as itself does not inform adaptation to these water shor shortages. For instance, if you improve how efficient you're using water resources, your water stress is the same, okay? Because it's a fixed demand. It doesn't tell you, okay, whether you need to store more water, okay? Because it's based on a mean annual river runoff. Okay? So it doesn't inform adaptation in terms of storage. You don't know how much storage is in your basin because storage isn't part of the equation. Again, you don't know whether you can withdraw more water from basin storage. I bring up this motion of, of, of these three uh, cones because these three tend to be key components of any adaptation to resource scarcity. You either use it more efficiently or you store, more, in the case of water, you, use, you store more water or you, you, or you withdraw more water from storage. So I would argue, and the, the polemic here is, there's a we need to do a major shift from fine-tuning estimates of freshwater flows to focusing much more on estimates and characterizing uh, freshwater storage. There is a strong potential of groundwater to improve resilience of communities to uh, changes not only in demand associated with population growth and improving, hopefully, livelihoods, but also to climate change. There's a fair bit of work, and this, this is one of the things that came out of the Kampala Conference in 2008, and if you, have, if you know nothing about the Kampala Conference or the Kampala Statement, there's a very quick URL address down there that you can copy down, gwclim.org. Okay. I'd also argue that we need to redefine water scarcity, not only in terms of how we measure and account for availability of fresh water, but also in terms of uh, better characterizing demand, so that water scarcity better reflects how people actually use water. So in Africa, again, this is where we talk about green water, people using soil moisture, much more than necessarily a dominant uh, irrigated uh, agriculture. And one of the benefits of moving towards a, to a movement on storage, and this is maybe a slightly complicated plot for some, for some of you, not very few. This represents a frequency distribution plot of flows. And really what I'm trying to show is the curve moves from the left and moves down to the bottom right and it represents the percentage of the year exceeding a certain discharge. And what we're saying is, if you have a, um, um, the blue, shaded blue area, is the current storage that you need to meet a demand. And I'll just point here. If you have a current demand at a certain amount, and it's defined by this line, that's the part of the year where you do not have enough river flow or enough, fl uh, enough flow to meet that demand. That's the storage you require, minimum storage, to meet that demand. Under more variable rainfall, under climate change scenarios, you may have more intense rainfall events, greater floods, and, your low, your, uh, uh, and the dry seasons may be drier. And you may need to move towards greater storage to actually um, respond to increase in demand and more variable discharge. So this is informative. You can begin to make decisions such as, do we, how do we generate that storage? How do we make sure that we are resilient to that demand and under those changing hydrological conditions? This could be small scale interventions such as, this is a subsurface sand dam where people are taking water. It's a dry riverbed, but there's water beneath the, uh, beneath the, the soil, the, the sandy soil you can see here. And again, subsurface sand dam, uh, where people draw the water, trap that water, and draw it out. Or you can talk about, and this is small scale, people could do rainwater harvesting, other small scale adaptations, storage adaptations, to, to, uh, to, to meet that demand under more variable hydrological conditions. This is a more extreme uh, case. But you could even compare that against reducing your demand for water, trading in virtual water, for instance, uh, importing more food, and reducing the amount of water you're actually using. Richard? Yeah, I've got to finish up. Okay, so, all right. I'd argue that the current water scarcity metrics do not represent the magnitude and dimensions of the global water crisis, but particularly they don't re uh, measure, uh, 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 indicate very well uh, the relationship between freshwater availability and demand in Africa. And we need to move towards an improved metric that, uh, can, uh, um, uh, that considers water storage and demand, uh, better considers water storage and demand, and even if we're not really sure that these metrics are the key issues to, to inform that, if you're going to talk about issues around power and economics that determine access to water, you're really going to need some understanding of the balance between um, uh, freshwater resources and demand to inform those debates. Thanks very much. Thanks.